So as Kimberly mentioned, I'm in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in the computer science department. And I, I thought I'd start with a motivation that's becoming more and more important to me, uh, which is uh, teaching ever-increasing classes, such as we have. But I get overwhelmed once I start having a couple hundred students. Um, but it caught all of our attention in, in my area when uh, um, some of my colleagues in artificial intelligence started teaching these massive online courses. And in fact, the first massive online courses were all taught by artificial intelligence people and all courses that I teach here at, at UCI. Um, and um, all of them take the scale of teaching to a, a kind of unheard of level. So in fact, 58,000 was, was much lower than it actually turned out to be. So if I can't teach a course to more than 200 students, think what it must be like to try to teach 160,000 students. Um, and one of the things that, that really uh, bites you as, as you try to scale something like this up is how you do any kind of assessment or feedback. Um, and uh, so if, if I, uh, we take the route that I take in my course, where I try to uh, do the assessment and give feedback, uh, this is my visual approximation of what I feel like. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just doesn't scale at all. Um, on the other hand, we could try to ask their peers to do it and get information from the other students. Um, but how can we really trust what their peers are, are giving us or, or telling us about other people's performance? So this is a, a motivation to try to use ideas from crowdsourcing uh, to improve here. Um, so in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on uh, computational and modeling aspects um, because crowdsourcing gets used in a lot of other places in machine learning as well. So in machine learning, we want to build data uh, models to predict things. And to do that, you need massive amounts of data. Um, so uh, if you're going to use these data as your ground truth and try to figure out what the relationship is to, to um, make your predictions, you need for the data to be reasonably accurate. So the same kind of problem is in, as in grading. You have uh, relatively bad uh, predictions, and you want to somehow extract high quality data out of them. So uh, the classic way that we do this in machine learning is the same as the instructor. right? You have an expert, a domain expert, either uh, your collaborator or one of your graduate students. Uh, and they go through all of the data, and they evaluate each one, and they provide you with some kind of label or, uh, or um, target for each one. Um, so this takes a lot of time, and it's really expensive. Uh, when I was in grad, stu uh, grad school, um, I had a lot of colleagues who uh, spent <laughs> a huge fraction of their thesis time essentially just uh, annotating a data set uh, that they were going to use to produce a paper or two. Um, the other thing you could do is just ask somebody random. Um, so this is cheap, uh, but they tend to be very unreliable. Right? You, you don't know that the quality of data you're getting out is enough. And so crowdsourcing uh, is, again, an attempt to try to combine many of these non-experts and clean up the quality so that you get something that's, uh, that's qualitatively similar to what the expert is producing. Um, so my favorite example of this is, uh, is the sort of wisdom of the crowd effect uh, from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which uh, is still on, apparently. Um, and um, if, you, if you watch this show, uh, so how many people have, have seen this show? Yeah, right. So if you watch this show, uh, they have um, uh, uh, these things called lifelines, which you can use to answer your questions. And uh, the two, I think, most interesting ones are you can phone your friend and get their advice, or you can ask the audience. Right? And um, so you have to sort of read on the web to find out the rules of these things. But it turns out that phone a friend works like this. Uh, before the, the show, you list, I think, four or five uh, of your friends. Um, and then after you see the question, you get to pick which friend you're going to call. And uh, then they tell you what they think the answer is. Right? So this is uh, presumably you're picking the, your five most intelligent and, and well-read uh, well friends. And then you get to pick the one who's the expert in the particular area of the question. And uh, they get the answer wrong a lot. <laughs> Um, but asking the audience, you ask 100 people who have nothing better to do than show up at a game show uh, and stay there all day long, and they have a clicker. And uh, this is wrong almost never. So there are only a couple of examples which people will actually post on YouTube of times when Ask the Audience gets it wrong. 
Um, and that's just because of this uh, wisdom of the crowd effect, where if you ask enough people, people who don't know the answer tend to disperse. And enough people who do know the answer concentrate on the right answer. Uh, and it pops right out of the, um, of the histogram. Um, so there are lots of platforms for doing this. Um, you can outsource your tasks to various public communities. People have talked about them uh, today and yesterday. Things like Mechanical Turk is probably one of the most uh, popular ones. Um, but Crowdflower is another, uh, Clickworker, and so on. Um, and so you can, you can use these platforms to, to analyze your data. But um, a lot of real world effects end up complicating the issue. Um, so uh, the actual decisions you make in, in how you're going to model your data and how you're going to try to uh, clean it up and assess your workers uh, turn out to be incredibly important and, and um, uh, make the difference between things working well or not in practice. So, um, uh, so the kinds of things that I mean are, for instance, how do you model your workers? How do you model the kinds of errors that your workers make? Um, how do you model what the population of workers look like? Um, and uh, how do we reason efficiently about the workers and the tasks simultaneously in these kind of very large scale systems. Um, and then in the second part, I'll also talk about a second aspect, which is how to incorporate expert advice. So um, we also have an expert, even though it's expensive to use them. Um, and uh, that expert can help us in a lot of ways in trying to um, improve our workers' performance. So, one thing we can do is beforehand, before we uh, give the tasks to the workers, we can have the expert do a certain amount of work. Um, for example, uh, labeling some of the tasks, and then use those pre-labeled tasks to try to assess the workers by pretending that we don't know the answer and feeding it to lots of, lot of <coughs> workers. Um, so uh, um, these are sort of what, what we'll call control questions. Um, and the worker doesn't know that we already know the answer, and so we can use it to assess uh, what their level of quality is. Um, another way we can use the expert is after we get our labels back from the crowd, uh, we can try to use the expert in a post hoc way to try to clean up any parts of the data where we're not sure about our answers. Um, and you could even kind of think about making this an iterative process where uh, after you do some labeling, you decide to feed the data back into the crowd and gather some more data, and so on. Um, so first, I'll start off talking about uh, modeling assumptions uh, and um, uh, computational algorithms for reasoning about workers. Um, so let me set up a very simple crowdsourcing problem to begin with. So we have a bunch of tasks, which we'll think of as images. And we're asking for the labels on those tasks, which are just whether they have a duck in them or not. So the label of the first image is no, minus 1. Uh, the label of the next three images is plus 1. They have ducks. Um, and we're going to show these images to a certain number of workers. So we have a, a list of workers indexed by J. And uh, say worker 1 here, I might show the first two images. And they'll provide their prediction of whether the image has a duck in it, uh, which we'll call Lij. So this is the label that worker J gives to task i. Okay? And our goal is then to estimate the true values uh, associated with these tasks, right? whether it really does have a duck in it or not. Um, and so we want to minimize the error, the number of errors that we make on those tasks. Um, and so the challenge of this is that uh, the workers are diverse. So some workers may be very good at recognizing ducks. Other workers may just be clicking at random, trying to get some money from us. Um, other workers might even uh, not like our research, and they go in and they try to mess up our data set so that we'll get bad results, and their paper will get in instead. So they might have some adversarial viewpoint. Um, and so a, a really simple model of uh, this kind of worker is to associate uh, each worker with some reliability score, which we'll call QJ for the moment. Um, so this is just the, uh, in, in this simple model, QJ is just the probability that uh, worker J gives the correct label for item i. So that the label they give for item i matches the true underlying label z. Um, <clears throat> and so then you can think of workers as being on this spectrum, where uh, if their value of uh, reliability is nearly 1, then they're experts. They're very good at doing this task. Uh, if their value of q is around a half, then they're doing it at random, since this is a binary task. 
Um, and if their value is less than a half, it means that they're wrong more often than they're right. So we'll call that adversarial uh, because they, they're probably intentionally getting the wrong answer. <clears throat> so um, what kinds of algorithms could you use in this simple case for predicting the Zs? Uh, the simplest thing you can do is just something like majority voting. Right? So for every item i, you just look at what the workers have labeled it, and you pick the majority uh, prediction. Right? And um, if you want to see how that works as a function of how many workers you have per task, uh, this is simulated data, but it sort of shows the general trends. Um, <clears throat> if you knew exactly, um, so this is, uh, this is from a model where either people are experts or not. Uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. If you knew which, um, which workers to listen to, uh, you could get a performance that improves like this black line. Um, but we don't know which workers are, are good. Um, this is how majority voting goes. So there's a huge gap and, in fact, a different rate of improvement between majority voting and Oracle, um, which has to do with uh, how many of our workers are trustworthy. Um, another algorithm which I'll uh, relate our methods to uh, that's interesting from a theoretical and computer science point of view, um, we'll call KOS after the authors. Um, and it's a message passing algorithm. It tries to exchange information in the system. So it tries to estimate the reliability of the workers, use that to estimate the label of each, uh, each uh, task, and then use the estimated label of the task to then estimate the reliability of the workers, and so on. So lots of algorithms have this sort of iterative flavor. Yes? Um, Carger, O, oh, and Shaw, the three authors. Yeah, it's, a, it's um, a paper from a few years ago in a theoretical computer science uh, um, conference. Um, so the, the main thing I want to mention about this, this algorithm is that um, the reason it's interesting from a theoretical point of view is that they proved that their algorithm has the optimal rate of improvement. So the rate at which this red line is going down is the best achievable by any algorithm uh, as a function of uh, improving workers per task. Yeah? Uh, the, the problem looks a lot like the problem that, that Michael Levy was talking about. Uh, and, and also the, the CCT theory. And it's been compared to a So this is a very basic model. Um, there are lots and lots of people who work with this model and different algorithms on this model. Um, so absolutely, it's, uh, I'm not trying to argue that this is new. Um, this particular algorithm, uh, what's interesting about it is that from a theoretical point of view, you can prove that this rate of convergence, this rate of improvement as you add workers to the task is the best achievable by any algorithm. So this is not my algorithm, but, but I find that quite interesting. Um, but you can see that the actual performance of the algorithm is not very good. Um, so in fact, there's a big regime where it's doing worse than majority voting. Uh, and while it's improving faster than majority voting, there's still a pretty big gap between it and the oracle. So all that I'm claiming about this algorithm, which is, is not mine, is that uh, the rate at which it decreases as I add workers per task it uh, can't be beat by any other algorithm. So no other algorithm will be steeper than this one. Uh, but it is not by any means the best algorithm. Does that make sense? OK, so, um, okay, so as I said, it has the optimal rate, but in practice it's not that great. So there's actually a, a big room for improvement in a practical sense. Um, so. Um, so let me sort of uh, get into some of the choices that make up that algorithm versus other variants and, and why those choices have a huge practical effect. So here's our worker model. Right? We are, we're assuming that the label that our worker produces depends on the true label and their reliability. Right? So it has a probability of Q that they'll be correct and 1 minus Q that they'll be wrong. And the other thing that we need to specify to have a complete model is a prior on how reliable we believe workers are in general. So this part only specifies the relationship between the worker reliabilities and what they'll label for us. 
So we also need to know about the population of workers. Um, and different choices that we make for this prior will turn out to have a really big effect. So some common choices that you might pick uh, as a probabilistic modeler um, are, say, this one, which is the, called the beta 1, 1 prior. It's essentially an uninformative prior over this reliability. So it says every value of the reliability is equally likely. So I'm just as likely to see someone who's an expert as I am somebody who's a spammer, as I am somebody who's an expert, but they're trying to mess up my data. Um, if I change the parameters of this beta distribution a little bit, I get something more skewed. So this is uh, beta 3.1, which is um, skewed toward experts. So it says I'm much more likely to see an expert, a little bit less likely to see someone who's a spammer, and I'm not very likely, but not impossible to see somebody who's antagonistic. Um, and then a common model that people will use in these systems that's quite simple is called the spammer hammer model. That's what I used for those curves. So the population is made up of two groups, one of whom are experts with a particular reliability, and one of whom are pure spamming, and they're just answering at random. Okay. So these, these are three possible choices that I might make about what the population of, um, of workers look like. Um, and so now, we can take this, uh, this simple network that I've been using to, to diagram how we farm out tasks, and it turns out that it has a concrete um, interpretation in structured probability distributions. So if we take this model and uh, integrate over the worker reliability, um, doing that, so the worker reliability, which is unobserved, acts to couple together the labels of everything that that worker looked at. So uh, if I know the value of, say, this task, that tells me something about this worker's reliability, which tells me something about the other tasks that that worker worked on, but then not directly anything about any of the other tasks. Um, and so you get a, a very structured probability distribution with a lot of independence in it. Um, and this turns out to be um, a classic form of large-scale modeling called graphical models, which ha happens to be my research area, where the tasks are associated with random variables. So we have one variable for each of these Zs, which indicate the value of the image. And each worker can be associated with a factor that couples together the labels on those, um, on those uh, variables. Um, and so, in fact, the factor actually only depends on the number of correct images that that worker J has. Um, and so the nice thing about this is that this is an incredibly widely studied uh, framework for probabilistic reasoning. And although uh, exact reasoning is very hard, uh, approximate reasoning is not. And we have many really good algorithms for approximate reasoning. Um, so the algorithm I work the most on is one called belief propagation. Um, it's a classical algorithm going all the way back to um, uh, Judea Pearl, who was at uh, UCLA in 1986. Um, and uh, what's nice about it is a, a very efficient message passing form, just like I suggested KOS did. Uh, you take information that you currently believe about uh, the workers, you pass it to uh, compute information about each task, and then each task then sends information to its neighboring workers to help them estimate their own quantities. And so everything is a local flow of information in this uh, graph. Um, and it's surprisingly accurate in a huge number of domains. So it gets used in statistical physics, image processing, computational biology, um, error correcting codes, data compression, all over the place. The exact same algorithm is, is very powerful and accurate. Um, so there's been a, a huge amount of work on, on this algorithm. Um, so we can actually just, once we have framed the model in this classical uh, graphical model form, we can just apply these um, uh, algorithms that we've spent a lot of time tuning and, and making work well. Um, and one thing that you find is that if you, that depending on the choice of your prior, uh, you can end up with uh, uh, some of these existing algorithms that I mentioned. So for example, if we have the, a, a prior that's just a hammer model, so uh, I imagine that my uh, population is made up of identical uh, people. They all have exactly the same reliability. 
uh, and it's somewhere over a half, um, then the BP algorithm, when you work out the details, it turns out to be exactly equivalent to the majority voting algorithm. So um, this kind of model is a very optimistic version of things, right? You're saying that uh, um, there's absolutely no diversity in my crowd, uh, and um, uh, and uh, uh, they're on the positive side of things. They're they're on average helpful, um, and so uh, so. Our algorithm, our running BP on this model, um, becomes equivalent to majority voting with this assumption. So in some ways, you can, you can think of majority voting as corresponding to this assumption, and that shows why it's a bit fragile. Right? If you have adversaries in this model, it'll do very poorly, because it assumes that everyone has exactly the same reliability. And um, the presence of those adversaries messes up your estimate of that reliability. So you can think of this kind of assumption as being very optimistic. On the other hand, it turns out that if you pick a very particular different prior called the Haldane prior, you get exactly this KOS algorithm that I mentioned before. Um, and the particular prior you need to pick is this one. So it puts a half of its probability on a worker being an expert and a half probability on them being an expert but antagonistic. So we're thinking that that half of our workers are on our side and very good, and the other half are, for some reason, working against us and equally good. Um, and this prior with the BP algorithm reduces to this KOS uh, technique. And so you can see what, what's going wrong and a little bit of why it doesn't work very well in practice, because this doesn't match our assumptions about what a crowd of workers should look like. Um, this is the highest possible variance that one can put on the workers. So it's sort of taking a worst case view that emphasizes the, uh, the presence of adversaries. And that's in some sense why it has the best possible rate. Um, but it's very pessimistic. And, and in practice, it doesn't really make sense with what we think the crowd probably is like. So um, if you look at uh, these simulated data so, um, and plot the behavior of these algorithms as you change the prior over the workers, you find something very interesting. So majority voting has this lower rate of improvement. Um, KOS has the best possible rate of improvement, but does quite poorly, especially uh, for smaller numbers. Um, and if you choose this other prior, other uninformative prior I mentioned, the beta 1, 1 prior, so all reliabilities are equally probable, you see something that behaves a lot like KOS. So, uh, KOS is a very uninformative prior in some sense. It's the highest variance prior. Beta 1, 1 is another uninformative prior in a, a different sense. Um, but they behave quite similarly. Um, but if you choose a prior that puts a little bit of information about what you actually expect the, uh, um, uh, the crowd to look like, um, it'll behave a lot better. So, Here's uh, so the true crowd that I used to generate this data was this spammer hammer model. Um, and you get pretty much the same rate as KOS, but now much better performance across the board. Um, and even if you use the actual true distribution of workers, uh, you don't really get much better. So part of what's causing this breakdown in something like KOS is that it's a mismatch to the reality of what these, uh, what these workers look like. Right? It's, it's imposing this worst case scenario. Um, yeah? So is this one simulated data? This is simulated so far, yes. I'll, I'll do real data in a second. Yeah. Um, so this is, just, uh, this is just to try to show these trends and what the difference is. Mm -hmm. um, so here's, um, here's some real data. Um, and uh, so, Can I ask you? Yeah, of course. Please. Um, so this is all with one particular choice of what the true population is, because I generated it. Um, and then these listings are what my model thinks the population looks like. So um, if my model uh, is trying to be very uninformative about what the population looks like, it doesn't do very well. Um, if it's a little bit skewed, even a tiny bit skewed, to think that the crowd is better than, uh, than spamming, on average, then it'll do much better. 
So in fact, we think that most of this breakdown is due to a symmetry problem where um, if things are uniform or, um, or exactly symmetric, uh, it's impossible to tell whether in, in these very small values, it's impossible to tell whether your workers are all antagonists or they're all on your side. So you need to do some kind of symmetry breaking uh, to so get tested, good behavior. You tested the extreme symmetries, but have mm -hmm. you tested symmetries, intermediate symmetries? Or is that, would that be a bad? Um, I'm not sure what an intermediate symmetry so you is. You tested the extreme with the half of the population being the experts that are benevolent and half of them that are experts that are. Benevolent. Yeah, so, so the Haldane one corresponds to KOS. That's the uh, two delta functions. Right. Um, uh, beta 1, 1 is a different symmetric prior where it's flat. Um, I'm, I, I suppose I could make uh, somewhere in the middle. I think they it would be right in with those. Um, but then anything that's uh, skewed slightly to one side. So in fact, a 2, 1 is about as unskewed as you can get. Uh, and as soon as you add a little bit of skew, uh, that effect goes away. Yes? Um, just back to the idea. Mm -hmm. They're having the same slope, so the, the rate of descent is actually the same. Um, so it's not possible for our rate of descent. Like, sorry? They're just starting the rate of descent. They're just, they're just shifted down. <laughs> yeah, so their performance is better, um, but increasing at the same rate. Yeah. So I am also inferring it, but to be a complete probabilistic model, I need a prior belief on it. So otherwise, I, I, otherwise it's an in, insufficiently specified model. I also am getting a posterior, but a posterior requires a prior, right? And, and you would think that with sufficient data, the posterior would not be dependent on the prior. It might have, yes, it might have been uniform. It might have been something like this. That's what this one is, right? And I'm saying that the symmetry is a problem. So in fact, this is quite a poor choice. And you'll do much better. I'm trying, I'm trying to get uh -huh. why, why adding information into the prior is, is important. And the results we saw earlier suggest that it's, it's been confined in, in a sense by our own constraints. And then you can get. Perhaps he would do better with a non uniform prior. I don't know. Uh, if, if Michael were here, we could ask him. But um, yes, uh, no. Uh, <coughs> I guarantee that Mike, Michael is a very good probability person. I guarantee he's got a prior somewhere. And uh, it might be uniform. And so my argument here is that it would probably do better if you made it slightly non-uniform. Uh, it, it makes a very practical but important difference. Um, he's also probably using Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And I'm using belief propagation. But uh, so that could make a difference as well. OK, so, um, so let me just show a, a real data example. Um, so uh, we got this data from uh, Willinder et al. And um, uh, so this, their paper uh, uh, was arguing for a fairly complex model uh, with latent features about um, the hardness of tasks. So the task is to uh, look at a picture and tell whether the blue bird in it is either an indigo bunting or a blue ghost beak. Um, I, I am not a birder, so I, I understand that this is a very hard task, uh, but I don't really know my, from my own experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, so their paper, this plot is uh, sort of from their paper, um, uh, <coughs> proposed a very complex model that had 
uh, a number of latent features for figuring out what the what what this image is like and how good is a particular person at uh, predicting images that have those features and so on. Um, and their argument was that their method did much better than majority voting. Uh, and here I've added the other things we analyzed, which also do do poorly. Um, but it turns out that this is a, a again a kind of modeling. Um, uh, this minor modeling error. Um, and if you just change the model I described before but in a tiny way, so instead of having one parameter for the accuracy, you give two parameters, which are the probability that if the image is a bunting, that you will accidentally predict gross peak. And another parameter for if the image is a gross peak, what's the probability you'll predict a bunting? And suddenly, uh, the belief propagation or uh, other algorithms as well, like expectation maximization, suddenly do it just as well as these much more complicated models. Um, it's still important that you pick the prior correctly. So um, there are a lot of subtle issues in this uh, that, um, uh, that dictate performance. Um, in particular, very small things like the algorithm that you choose for reasoning, um, making sure that it's a a uh, solid choice with good approximation qualities, and little things like the prior that you put in on these parameters. And they can have a, a really large effect on your performance. Is that, is that tantamount to taking, uh, to breaking the symmetry with your prior by introducing just sort of random noise to the, to the thing? I mean, basically, you're saying at some point, if it's a bunting and you say a gross back, do you have to do flip a coin, or is? So, uh, my model of mistakes is a coin flip, yes. And this is a, the, the beta prior is on the bias of each person's coin, right? So what, what the beta 2, 1, the symmetry break in this corresponds to is saying that it's slightly more likely that each person will get a correct prediction than an incorrect prediction. And then I need to reason about what their actual probability is. OK, so, um, so the algorithm we choose, and in particular, things, very small things like the prior can have a really outsized effect on performance. Um, so the second part I want to talk about is, um, uh, is how to then take expert advice and inject it into this situation. Um, and again, I'll, I'll sort of talk about two settings. One is where we have experts work beforehand, and then we can use that uh, inside our crowd assessment proce process. And the other is where we get all the data from the crowd already, and then we have the expert come in and try to help us later. OK, so the, I'll, I'll talk about sort of the first one first. Um, and um, uh, here I'm going to switch to uh, real valued predictions instead of binary predictions, um, because uh, some of the effects come out much more um, powerfully in, in real valued problems. So this is a data set we got from uh, Mark Stivers, who's one of our collaborators on this part. Um, on uh, estimating the price of items, uh, I think they were from um, uh, Walmart and uh, Costco or something. I, I can't remember. Um, and uh, we have actually two data sets. So one data set had 155 participants. The other had 287. Um, and uh, each person is asked to predict the cost of a certain set of items. Okay? And, um, so I, I know from experience that um, when I do this task, right, my wife asks me uh, how much I think something costs. Uh, and my internal process is I generate a number, I multiply it by 2, and then I say it. And, and uh, usually I'm not too far under. <laughs> um, and so uh, um, the, the idea here is that, that the predictions tend to be extremely biased. So if you plot the, um, the uh, predicted price divide the log of the predicted price divided by the true price on all of these workers, you see a histogram that looks like this. So if they were perfectly correlated, if the, the predicted prices were the same as the true prices on average, they would be here at zero. But in fact, this entire population of workers is like me. They're skewed downward. I, I'm actually over here at minus 0.6 or something. So I'm, I'm particularly bad. But they all have the same process I do, which is that they uh, systematically undervalue the items that they're predicting. Um, and so if you want to correct for this kind of, yes, question? Well, I was just about to say how to correct for it. Yes. 
Now, so so I'm, I'll, I'll analyze this in a second. Yeah. So um, to, to correct for this, you, you need some kind of control item. Because in a standard setup, if you can assume that the average worker is correct, then you can only work with the worker's assessment. But in this case, the average worker is underestimating. So any averaging process that you get will also systematically underestimate. So the only way to correct for this bias is to try to inject some ground truth into the situation. Okay, so, um, so one way of doing that are, are control questions. Um, and they're a particularly efficient way as long as your expert can work first. So in a control question, you have the expert label a bunch of data points for you. And then when a crowd worker comes, uh, you feed them some of these known examples in the set that they're trying to answer. Um, and they don't know which are which, so they do the same amount of work on, on all the examples. Um, and then you can use this population of known answers to tell you about their reliability and their bias. Right? Um, and so this is powerful because I don't need the work, the expert to do very much work. Right? The expert could label the same five questions for me. So only, only label five questions. And then every worker I feed those five questions somewhere in their setup. Um, and so I don't need the expert to, to go to much effort for me to use it to assess everybody in the crowd. Um, and so you can think there are sort of two sets. Each worker sees two sets intermingled. Some of them are control questions with known answers that we'll use just to evaluate workers. Others of them are target questions that we're really interested in answering. Um, and so now there's a, a, a trade-off or a balance to be struck because if I don't ask very many control questions, then I don't get much information about this worker's bias. Right? Um, but I have a lot of bandwidth left over to ask them questions I care about. If, on the other hand, I spend all of their questions asking things I know the answer to, I'll know a lot about their bias, but I won't have very many questions left for, uh, for, for me to learn about my, um, my tasks. So, in a, uh, so we'd like to set this up as an optimization problem where we have L, uh, L tasks per worker. And we'll use k of those to ask control questions and leave the remaining L minus k to be target questions. And see if we can ask what the optimal balance here between the number of control questions and the number of target questions is. Um, so it turns out that the answer to this depends on a, a few details. Um, one of them is uh, the model that we're going to use to do the reasoning. Um, and so I'm mostly going to just use this bias only model, which is a simple real valued model where the label, the, the prediction of my worker is the true value plus the worker's bias plus some independent random noise um, uh, with the same, same variance per worker. Um, you can make this more sophisticated, and, and we do in our papers, but I, I won't go into it. You can make it heteroscedastic where every worker has, a, has their own variance as well. Uh, you could make it where there's uh, no bias and the variance is just estimating the reliability. Um, but here, I'm just going to use this bias only because it makes it simpler. Yeah? So, so your model, so this is assuming that, so, so your model can't handle sort of the idea that you could maybe learn something about bias from, from your, your target type that you built out. Ah, so that's the, se the, that's the next slide. Sorry. Yes. So the other dichotomy is in the way that you reason about these parameters. So um, one option is that we can do this two-stage procedure where we take the control questions, we use them to estimate the quality and, and biases of the workers, then we fix those and then use them to assess our target questions. Um, and the other is a sort of joint estimation, which is much more like what I talked about in the first part, where we simultaneously reason about the worker reliabilities and the target questions with the control questions answers known, fixed in the model. Right, so this is much more like what I did in the first half. Um, and so what you find if you analyze these is that they behave slightly differently, but related. So uh, um, the optimal value of k here, the, the amount of control questions I should ask the worker, grows with square root of l, the, the number of tasks that that worker does. Um, so there's a constant term in front depending on what model you pick, but for the bias only model, it's one. So it's uh, approximately square root of L. Um, 
On the other hand, the joint estimation model uh, grows in a slightly different way. So the optimal value of k is actually L divided by the number of tasks uh, that I have. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at this, you can find that this k star is always better than the two-stage estimation one. It always takes fewer control questions for this joint reasoning. Um, and you can sort of see a, a long-range version of that. If I have a lot of tasks total then th and keep L approximately fixed, this number will go to 0. So I, I need asymptotically possibly 0 control questions um, in this kind of two-stage estimation. And the reason, yes? Sure. Uh, so do you have a sense of like, uh, so, so if you're learning the bias from target questions, obviously the control questions are going to then kind of constrain that inference a little bit. So do you have an idea of like, let's say if you did it with some target questions with no control and then with some, is it, do you have a sense of if it's going to like qualitatively change, change the responses or is it going to sort of make the four, ste four series a little bit more certain they run the same? Um, the bias, on your inference about the bias, mm -hmm. I mean, is it going to significantly change where the bias is located, like the mean of the bias, say, or is it just going to sort of make it a little tighter so you don't have to four series? So well, there's a there's a uh, there's a symmetry when you have zero control questions. So moving slightly off zero is critical. Um, but then um, uh, then it depends on which of these two frameworks you're in. So if you're in this framework, you can sort of see that if I only have a few control questions, I have a lot of uncertainty about my bias, and so I might make a fair number of mistakes on my target. Um, on the other hand, in in this one, knowing even a couple of control questions can resolve some workers, which resolves some targets, which resolves some more workers, which resolves other targets. And in that case, you have the chance of, of bootstrapping your way to a solution. Um, so we tried this on uh, a couple of real data sets. So one of these is uh, uh, point spreads for NFL games. Um, point spreads are essentially crowdsourced anyway. So uh, the, the predictions of a crowd model and the real data are quite similar. And so what we did is just in this data, we simulated what would happen if we used a different values of k of control questions um, and what would the optimal value of k be. And so as you change the budget, we would just run all the k's and then we would report whichever k gave the best performance. And that's this cyan curve. And our predicted rate is this red curve. So this is a very good match. Um, for the joint estimator, we did exactly the same thing. You can't ever have less than one uh, because then you have a symmetry problem. But then after that, uh, it grows in a slightly noisy way. And our prediction is this green line, which again matches quite well. Um, these data are kind of ideal because they're because uh, point spreads really are the average of people's opinions. Um, but uh, we tried it on the price data set as well and is a little bit less good of a match, but still kind of the same general trends. Um, one, one more thing to mention about this is that if we misspecify the model, um, there turns out to be a big difference in how these two approaches go wrong. So even though the, even though the joint estimator always needs fewer control questions than the two-stage estimator, if our model is wrong, things can go quite, wrong, quite badly. Um, and so what we find is if we, this is simulated data but with the wrong model, um, the two-stage estimator still behaves pretty similarly um, because it's impossible for this two-stage approach to, um, to do too much uh, overfitting to the, um, uh, to the data that it sees. On the other hand, the joint estimator, uh, because of this iterative process, it can really be led astray by, uh, by having the wrong model. So again, this kind of, um, the choice that you make in this, yes? Uh, so I simulated uh, data from a model that, um, that had a bias in it. Uh, and then I used an algorithm that didn't know there could be a bias. So it used only variance. Right? And so what happens is uh, the algorithm tries to reason about things. There's a user who has uh, low variance but some bias. And the algorithm is forced to explain it by setting their variance. And so uh, as it iterates, 
it can change the variance of all of the users in an attempt to explain the control data. And there's not very many control data, so it will overfit. And then it'll do quite badly on real data. OK, so, um, uh, so that's what, what can happen if you can insert control questions beforehand. Uh, how many control questions you should use is something like uh, root L if you're doing a two-stage and L over root N if you're uh, doing a joint estimator. Um, so another thing we've looked at is what happens if you do things afterwards? So what happens if I already went to the crowd and I already got my answers and now I'm not happy with their performance? I want to spend some expert advice and try to see what, how I can improve things. Um, and so again, you see this kind of trade-off. But now in what kinds of questions you should ask your expert to focus on? So one thing you might do is look at your items. And any item that you're really uncertain about, you might want your expert to go in and fix it. Right? And that will fix at least that item. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, another kind of, of thing you might have your expert do, is you might look for an item that was seen by a lot of workers. And now if you label this item, you'll find out a lot of information about your workers. So you might have been reasonably confident of this item, but once you know its answer, you gain a lot of information about their expertise, which then tells you about other items. And so there's some balance here between targeting items that will improve your performance and targeting, uh, sorry, that will improve your performance directly on those items and targeting items that will have a big effect in terms of their number of uh, users that they resolve. Um, and so what you can try to do is quantify this effect and get an estimate in your system of how much any particular item will resolve the, the variance of your overall system. Um, and so we did this. Uh, and uh, you can compare the improvement rates of just making a local choice, so picking the item that you're most uncertain about, versus looking at this global variance reduction effect. And so this is simulated data, so you'd expect it to work uh, quite well, and it does. Uh, in fact, the local choice turns out to be worse than random, because the local choice is only t tends to only pick things that weren't seen by many users, because you're, then you're very uncertain about them. and then. Resolving them only fixes that one item and doesn't help very many other items. Um, on the other hand, the local global, you actually see an interesting phase transition where at the beginning, you're targeting items. You see a very steep improvement as you're targeting items that have a lot of effect. And then at some point, the improvement flattens out. Uh, and at this point, you've targeted all the things that tell you about a lot of users, and you're just starting to hit uh, the same ones that were improving things locally. Um, in real data, this behavior is a, a little bit uh, less, uh, less obvious, but still at least a little bit present. So again, using this local, this is on uh, age prediction problems, where you look at a face and you predict how old they are. Um, uh, using this notion of, of how much the variance will be reduced overall still at least helps over just local or random choices. Um, so in summary, uh, in crowdsourcing, I think it's a very powerful framework to use this kind of graphical model structured reasoning. Um, and we can trade off complex models versus uh, useful algorithms. So in fact, we often prefer simple models with good choices of priors and better reasoning algorithms. Um, things like uh, efficient message passing algorithms like belief propagation, I think, can be particularly powerful. Um, and, uh, and in general, this framework just lets us build on a lot of successful research in artificial intelligence on graphical models and, and reasoning. Um, the second thing is this kind of uh, um, uh, allocation process of how I use my scarce expert resources to try to improve things. I can either use it before the crowd and then inject the crowd with that information to try to Get uh, to, to try to get more knowledge about their expertise. Or after my data has already been done, I can try to figure out how I can use that expert to try to clean up the results. And again, in either case, you have an allocation problem of either how much uh, should I allocate to each user, 
beforehand? Or where should I place my expert uh, effort in the, in the latter case? Um, and um, uh, so I, I think this is a, a, a very useful and interesting way of thinking about things and trying to improve the algorithmic behavior of the algorithms. Um, so I'll just quickly thank my collaborators, so co-authors, my student Chang Lu and our friend Jian, uh, Mark Stivers here in Cognitive Science, and John Fisher, who's uh, Chang's postdoc advisor at MIT. Um, and then I have a number of uh, collaborators in peer grading, uh, which was an application I didn't get to talk about. Um, but I'm currently working with Ken Pavendale and Brian Sato on uh, using these um, real valued predictors for peer assessment in, in large courses. Okay, thanks. It should do well if they're all the same and good, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't do any better than majority. OK, know. yes, no, that's, that's correct. Yeah, yeah and, sure. And the, the parameters of the model that, that go for, you know, that, that we use as indicators of uh, that. Yes. Um, and uh, the same, by the same token, if you have variable you know, response patterns, which you do usually in human data, um, you know, and, and sometimes if there's more variable, Yeah, you shouldn't be able to reduce the number of data you need unless you have a selection process where you can pick only the experts. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're really just selecting who to listen to, right? Uh, yeah, but I'm just trying to, in my mind, I'm trying to draw a parallel between you're, you're very, you know, you're very, our human, our way of trying to model human thing. And mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. No. So, uh, I mean, I, I'll say all of the models that I'm showing here are, um, are, are very simplified versions of real models. I think they're actually still quite useful. In fact, they do as well as the state of the art in many cases. Um, but they're so simple because it lets us analyze them. Right? So if, if you add a little bit of complexity, like some latent uh, factors that influence how well people will perform, suddenly analytically saying anything about performance becomes really hard. Um, and um, so I, I think that there are definitely situations where that kind of thing helps a lot. Um, but surprisingly, there are some cases when it doesn't seem to help much, even, uh, even though you might think that it does, uh, just because of minor changes in things like uh, the population distribution. Um, so, uh, so I don't know if that answered your question yeah, or not. but. Yeah, so, so I mean, I would think of all the models that I'm showing here as, um, as simplified skeletons of a model that you'd really use. Um, but hopefully the conclusions that you can draw about them, uh, like um, uh, you know, how to be careful about setting your prior on your, uh, on your population, or uh, how to allocate uh, 
control versus target questions, hopefully all of those will transfer over, e even though it's a little bit, um, you know, there's a, there's a gap between what we can do theoretically and what we want to do in practice. Yeah, if you can figure out who the antagonists are, they're actually useful, right? Um, so, so, um, but it's it's um, it's sort of the mismatch between the true population and what you think the population looks like that can break you. So, if you're not aware that there can be any antagonists, then you can end up in trouble because the antagonist is being treated by as at worst a spammer or something. Well, the, so the best thing would be to have a lot of really good experts, right? Um, but uh, absolutely, if you had to pick between a lot of experts and some spammers, a uh, smaller number of spammers, versus a lot of experts and a smaller number of antagonists, you'd do better with the antagonists. Because you'd figure out which one of them, which one of them were deceiving you, and then you'd just reverse their results in, in this binary case. So. Uh -huh. Spammer hammer like. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, does your work shed light on that? Like, so I in a data set, you can try to a analyze what the actual population looks like. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've we've done that, but I don't have any results, and I don't remember even what they turned out to be. Um, they're they're definitely not spammer hammer in the sense that spammer hammer sort of posits that there are literally two groups. And you know they're all either the same expertise or they're all no expertise. So there's definitely more of a smooth thing than that. Um, but um, uh, no, I think that's a really interesting empirical question. Is uh, um, it probably depends a lot on the hardness of your task in some sense too. Um, so I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see an empirical study of that. I, I don't know. The motivation for the conjecture was that you know there's a lot of work about matching. Workers to with certain skills to certain tasks, and it sounds like my, it sounds like overkill to me. You know, it's just good workers and not so good workers. And <laughs> yeah, well, that's I mean that's certainly what um, this uh, this Grosbeek experiment suggests yeah, is exactly. uh, you know they spent a ton of work trying to figure out which workers were good at side uh, you know side views of Grosbeeks or whatever, and it turns out there's just a People who always guess Grosbeak when they're wrong, <laughs> and people who always guess bunting when they're wrong. So what's the beta 2, 1 look like? Uh, the beta 2, 1 is this uh, straight line. Okay. So, so it just, uh, yeah. Yes? Um, so I'm just, I'm, so your prior, your prior on the, the expertise thing, I'm trying to relate it to, so we have, so we're doing a consensus theory model on crossword data. So we have an expertise, and we literally have Bayesian implementation, so we have, we're doing a beta 1, 1 prior on it. And I'm trying to think of how to relate, how to relate your insights, because I think our expertise is more like, it doesn't have the, uh, it doesn't have the, the negative folks. It's almost like it, it runs from your completely random to experts to like your right side of your scale. Only. Okay. Um, so I just, I wonder if you have any insight of how to think about prior on that I'd say you're in a good shape already in the sense that if, if nothing can be below skill a half, you've already broken the symmetry that ruins some of these well, we algorithms. Well, that's just the assumption of the model. Um, so it's, it yeah. goes from, expertise goes from zero to one, but I think zero in, our, in that model is Zero like means random? Yours. Yeah, OK. You don't have the negative. You don't have like the, the uh, what did you say, attacking or the adversary. Yeah. So our practical experience is that it, it needs to be asymmetric. It, it, uh, it should have this kind of preference for skilled workers over unskilled workers. Um, but uh, that almost anything um, within that framework that's not too strong is fine. So uh, you know, 
in, in this example, all the different priors that we tried kind of behaved the same. I mean, this, this was our ground truth. So probably if our ground truth were different, the spammer hammer might not have done so well. Um, but um, anything that's um, sort of not a very strong prior, uh, but at least has this symmetry breaking, uh, seems to do really well. Yeah. A beta, well, beta 1010 will just be this curve, but stronger. <laughs> so it'll uh, listen to the data less and have this awful symmetry. But, but beta 101 would sort of look, uh, you know, very skewed like that. Yes? So um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand, but I, I would just sort of generally argue, as I, I do in one of my classes, that uh, any model where you haven't specified the prior on your, on, the, on your full model, you actually have specified the model, but in a way that you didn't intend to. So it's always better to, uh, to say exactly what you want all the priors to be, and then you know what your model thinks. Uh, if you leave out the prior, then uh, it just is whatever happens to be in the in the in the math without specifying it. Uh, so you know, in in sort of common cases like maximum likelihood, it turns out to be something like this, which is not what you want. So I think it's always better to fully specify the model. So, uh, I should be careful because I'm not positive about which, uh, about the exact model you mean. But if I used my model, but then did maximum likelihood estimates of the Q um, with, uh, with no prior, but in the, in the parameterization that I gave, um, it would behave almost exactly like this uh, BP beta if I, if I did EM with uh, maximum likelihood and no prior. Um, because leaving out the prior would be equivalent to this, this particular flat prior. And uh, BP and EM are a little bit different. EM is a little bit worse than the BP, but not much in our practice. So I think it would behave a lot like this curve. Um, and and that, that has the symmetry problem that if you break the symmetry, it'll do a lot better. 